This is the Ride Giant Podcast. I am your host, Patrick Van Horn, uh, coming to you still from my home. Uh, It's been a couple of months since we've had a chance to put together one of these podcasts. And uh, our guest today is a man with 10 national titles and hundreds of elite and amateur race wins and one race across America. Um, it is Rasan Bahati. He's uh, one of Giants elite ambassadors. And uh, we're talking to him today from uh, from his home in Southern California. Rasan, welcome, man. It's good to talk to you again. Hey, Patrick, thanks for having me. You bet. Hey, this is, uh, you know, kind of a big time uh, for you. I mean, there's a there's a major anniversary going on in your life uh, with the Bahati Foundation, 10 years uh, th- that the Bahati Foundation has been in existence. Congratulations. That is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's uh, it's definitely been, um, uh, I, I, I want to say it's definitely been rewarding, but it's definitely been tough. Um, and I think maybe that's, that's what makes it more rewarding, but, uh, you know, this is interesting time we're, we're living in right now. So to have something, uh, as such a monument for us, you know, uh, selfishly, the Baha'i Foundation, what we do to, to support inner city youth, but on the flip side, you have, you know, what's going on in our society today with the pandemic and social unrest and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's an interesting time. So just happy that we could actually have some positive, um, input into our society with our 10th anniversary anniversary and um you know we'll probably have to do it all over again next year since uh, we, we couldn't fulfill all the things that we wanted to do um with our celebration and, and, and continue to get back to our community yeah can you t- take me back 10 years take us back 10 years what was it at the time where you established the uh, uh the Bahati foundation what was the goal what did you think would happen what 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 did it, what was it like back then? Well, you know, I was racing professionally and, and traveling the world and gone from my home for 10 months out of the year. And, um, you know, you just, it was one of those, some people call it, uh, coming to Jesus moments. I call it, um, you know, I just had an epiphany and, and it was, it was me racing in Europe and not really enjoying myself at the time, but realizing that, wow, look at this. Like I'm in another country, literally riding a bicycle. Um, and somebody's paying me to do it. And I, I'm definitely a believer in you, you, you do something that you love to do and you find someone to pay you to do it. And that's the happiest place you could ever be. Um, and, but what I realized is that where's everybody who looks like me, you know, from spectators to coaches to directors to any of the staff. And then of course the racers, there were no, uh, there were no black cyclists. And I grew up in the inner city of Compton. And how did I find the sport of cycling and go on and do the thing that I did through the sport, but no one else did. And, and that was kind of the moment I had, uh, specifically I was in Switzerland. Um, and yeah, initially it was, it was the low hanging fruit. It was like, all right, how can we get kids on bikes and get them to race? Um, that's definitely a, a tough thing to do. And as the foundation started to grow and realize what impact a bicycle could have, not necessarily just for bike racing, but the tool that it brings to you, um, that's where we started to expand. You know, that's when it was more about just exposure and uh, helping the kids build confidence and, and work on their social skills and know that there's a big world out there for them. They don't have to be confined to the inner city, um, which they grew up in. And over that period of time, you have mentored uh uh hundreds 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 of uh youth um given them an opportunity to experience cycling um Mm -hmm. any idea of of the numbers you know um we have our own you know metrics of uh some of the children and schools that we work with right now we work with six to seven different schools within LAUSD that's uh, Los Angeles Unified School District Plus some Long Beach, some Compton. Um, I would say annually we're having a positive impact of, you know, maybe 2,500 kids a year. Um, 
what I've learned though recently, Patrick, is that through the power of social media, um, you know, when I first got started with the foundation, it was like my space and, and Facebook had just kind of just launched. Right. Um, so, and there was no Instagram. So it wasn't that big. It wasn't easy for us to really get the word out. And what I found out recently over the last few years is that just me alone being out there and competing, me being out there doing things like race across, right across America and kind of get, getting my name out there in, in different areas where it's not for the elite racer. Um, I've learned that there's a lot of people watching who I've inspired, you know, and I get these notes here and there through my social media platforms. Like, man, I saw you at the Philadelphia Classic in, in 96 or 97. I was blown away. I went out the next week and bought a bike. I've been riding ever since just because of you. And then they go on to have a family, which their family, now their kids are into cycling, or even if it's just recreationally, you know, they, they're, they're on a bike. And then that just starts this trend of being active and being on the bike and have a bicycle. It's such a cool vehicle for so many cool things. So um, I don't know the exact number to answer your question, but I know that it's, uh, it's scaling across places that I didn't even know we were having reach. The initiative of uh, the Bahati Foundation, and, and I want to tell uh, folks who have not visited the website, it's it's the Bahati Foundation dot uh, org. Um, Correct. There's something that you mention on there when you're talking about impact, and it's the Motion Equals Healthy Initiative. Let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit. Of, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that initiative actually uh, was developed uh, by my dad. Um, that was his vision um, to really focus on not only the youth, because this is all about the entire family. This is about making sure the family stays is healthy because oftentimes you have a child who's an athlete or involved in some sort of after school sports or, or something like that, uh, park sports, but then the parent is just stagnant, you know, and they're not doing anything. So the whole motion equals healthy is like, let's get everyone involved, let's get everyone moving because just that movement along uh, helps you become a healthier person, helps you make healthier choices. And so that's what that initiative is all about. And it's also, um, it, it also has another layer about uh, healthy eating habits and making sure you're getting your, your uh, yearly screenings and tests and stuff like that. Um, something that really is, is kind of, um, it's overlooked in the inner city and in the neighborhoods which we impact. So uh, this was an important, important initiative for us to get off the ground. Uh, which we did last year, and, and uh, we'll continue to push that narrative forward. And had there been something like the Bahati Foundation for you uh, when you were a young man, uh, you, when you were a youngster, it would have made a, a huge impact in your life. Um, but as it was, you had one individual that looked at you and said, hey, I think you should try cycling. Mm-hmm. And, 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 yep, uh, Mr. Reggie Garman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, and, and that story, uh, you, I mean, you, you told us, uh, last year when we had you on a podcast and you, and you've told it before, um, you were, had been in trouble at school and, uh, this mm-hmm. guy, this guy took you aside and said, Hey, I've got an idea about how you can work that energy off. And, uh, what was it? He told mm-hmm. you, he mentioned cycling and, and you didn't think it meant riding a bike. Well, he said bikes. Bikes. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bikes in my, in, in my head translated to motorcycles, like dirt bikes. <laughs> right. You know, uh-huh. like, you know, how for my bike. Um, yeah, so that's what I thought. And, you know, I always think about him uh, often and I just wish, you know, he's, he's a good example of what, you know, an individual should be like when you're trying to help someone overcome hurdles you know, uh, patience, you know, compassion, um, you know, empathy, sympathy as well, you know, and not just give up because that's what happens often, um, within, you know, uh, I'll use ghettos, you know, with, within these inner cities where there's a lack of infrastructure and, uh, the, the teachers are not as experienced to deal with, um, these sort of kids. So they give up on them. And then, you know, that trajectory of, where they end up is, is quick within, within four to five years, they're 
you know, on the streets, they're dead or in jail or something like that. They don't have a job. They're selling drugs, whatever it may be. So it's, you know, you look at what he did, he could have very easily just took me to the principal's office and, and suspended me, which leads to other things that I could have done because now I don't have mom and dad at home and I'm, I'm home alone and I'm suspended from school, but he took the time to like care about me. And I, and that's what I think about most, you know, that, uh, and I wasn't the only one. Um, he, he was just, that was just the type of person he is. He is so I always think about him in a positive light. What was it about cycling as you got into it? Um, uh, what was it that you thought was the coolest thing about it? Because there weren't a lot of people who looked like you. And, you and came. that's what it was. And that's what it was, Patrick. It was, it was like, wait a second. I've been running track. I've been playing football, playing basketball. I even played baseball. And we all look the same, right? All yeah. black, all black guys, black kids. And then all of a sudden, I get to the village room, and I was never turned off because they were white. But I was like, "Man, look how fast she is!" And I say she because I always think of Sarah Hammer, uh, right. multiple time Olympian for the U.S. Um, world champ. But she was there as a kid, same age as me. And I'm like, "Man, she's good. I mean, she's a girl." You know, you have that whole mentality, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was just something about it. I just took to it. It was, it was so much fun hanging with them more than the bike. The bike was the secondary thing. It was like, I'm actually having fun hanging out at the velodrome, meeting people like that live all over the, all over Southern California. And we're all here on two days a week having fun. Uh, but the tipping point <laughs> where it really changed where I was like, all right, I kind of like this cycling thing was when I beat an 18 year old and I was like 13 and an expert and just the excitement from the coaches, I think got me excited. It made me feel good. You know what I mean? Like you had all these people that really didn't know me all of a sudden giving me high five and patting you on the back. I'm like, all right, you know, like gave me that boost of confidence. And, and that was kind of like the turning point where she, I haven't looked back since that was, man, that was like 90, like 95 or something, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, you achieved a, a great deal of success. I mean, you were, uh, I can remember uh, working in bike shops when I first got into the industry and uh, mm -hmm. learning about you and uh, following your career of, uh, for a little while of racing. And it kind of got, subsumed for me. And I think for a lot of people, because when most people who aren't in the industry think of bike racing, they think of the tour de France. And if you're not, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not racing in the tour de France, who are you? But mm -hmm. you, you had a, a great deal of success, uh, in your career. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when you, when you go through the ranks and you're, you're trying to become the best cycle, the boy in the, the biggest teams in the world, you know, like as a basketball player, I would have wanted to play for the Lakers or, you know, I'm a Cowboys fan. So if I played football, I would have wanted to play for the Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, with cycling, it's kind of the same thing. You have these big teams at the top of the sport, you know, and back then it was, of course, Atlantis was kind of running the show. So you had the postal services and the discoveries and, and all those teams. And those are the teams you want to race for. And of course they do to cycling standards, the biggest races in the world. Um, so to, to, to sit here and say, I didn't want to do the Tour de France, I would be telling you a lie. I didn't want to do the Tour de France, but as I work my way through the ranks, you know, I, I realized that probably that's not in, it, it's not in my cards, you know, just, uh, just the way I was developed as a cyclist. Um, you know, there was, there were years where I really didn't take it seriously, but, but was still winning. Um, and then I, I, I finally realized, you know, this is my lane. I can have an impact on the people in my community by doing X, Y, and Z. So that's really what I started to focus on. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to win a national title at pretty much every level from a junior to an amateur to a pro and participated in some world championships and did some big races in Europe. So, you know, looking back, there, there are a few things that I think I would change, but I, I definitely have no regrets. We are now in a strange, strange time in America because it seems like so many people uh, are becoming considerably more awakened to uh, systemic racism that exists in America. But I want to move into what your 
um, what your reception was as you achieved success. And, and as you did go to Europe, you did race in Europe. What was mm -hmm. your reception by your teammates, uh, by the competitors you raced against as you be began achieving success? Because there, there weren't other people who looked like you who were standing mm -hmm. on the podium. Yeah, for the most part, it was negative, um, at least from the outside. Most of my teammates were cool. I don't have a lot of negative things to say about the people that I had to bunk up with, um, you know, and, and I try not to make excuses for people's ignorance, um, but there's definitely a lot of ignorance within some of the teams I was on um, and definitely outside of the teams. And, you know, unfortunately back then, I, I wasn't confident enough, and I wish I were. Um, I also wasn't, you know, mature enough to stand up and, and say certain things at, at certain particular times. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, those it's just one of those things you look back on. Is it was, you know, you're growing. You know, it, it was a, some learning experiences there. Um, but racing in Europe was was tough in black, uh, being the only. I call it raisin and milk. Uh, over there, you know, and yeah. you're you're in a peloton with you know 160 guys, and you're literally the only dark skinned brother around, you know, from spectators to everything else. So um, it it was always funny to to be somewhere like in Frankfurt, and you see some black people, and we <laughs> instantly lock eyes and, and give like a little fist bump, like all right, I see you, um, because like you're, you're on an island, you know, and you want someone that you can relate to. Um, so that, you know, that was always tough, but I never allowed it to interfere with my bike racing. I always went about my business. Uh, even, even the ignorant stuff that I experienced while traveling, uh, within the U S and abroad, I, I never, I just never let it get to me, you know, um, you know, patience, I think grows a little less as you get older. You know, I had a situation the other day where a lady still grabbed her purse and it's like, I said, really late, you know, out loud, like, really, you think I'm going to grab your purse, blah, 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 you know. Um, but back in the day when that happened, I would just ignore it and, and, and turn a blind eye. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not a confrontational person, and I think that's where that comes from. Uh, but, you know, um, cycling still has a long way to go. Uh, someone, when, when all the, you know, Black Lives Matter movement really started to take hold and the, the internet with George Floyd, is now a worldwide topic. You know, one of the first questions I got for someone, a reporter was, you know, uh, what do you think about this? And my honest to God truth answer was nothing's different. Yeah. I've been, I grew up with this. I grew up in Compton where I saw police kill someone on the front porch. Like this is not different. We're talking, you know, 18 years ago. So it's, it's more visible now. And, I hate to say that it's a, it's a fad or a trend, but to a certain extent, I feel that people are kind of just hopping on the bandwagon and if it dies down, you would never hear from them again. And honestly, within the industry, that has already happened to me, you know? Um, and I'm just keeping water with you. I was getting so many calls, um, you know, after, after George Floyd's murder, a lot of, you know, from my experience and what I, what I had to do with a lot of like the industry, you know, reached out being one of, a few black writers within the industry um, and wanted to get my take on it, which is totally fine. I'll give you my take. Um, but one of the saddest things about it is, you know, I feel like that conversation has kind of died out. Um, so I'm actually happy that we're talking and you're continuing to push the envelope on these topics because it, it, it needs to be talked about. It can't be a checkbox for most of these companies. All right, we did it. We got out of the way now back to making money. It's like, no, the way we're going to really have this shift is to continue to educate people, continue to hear people off that's been going through these things that have been uh, prejudged in almost every situation that he's walking through, speaking of myself, that has dealt with racism. You know what I mean? Uh, that yeah. has been marginalized specifically in this sport. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty much, you know, kind of like how I feel about it. Even though it's new to a lot of people, it's not new to me, man. That, that was my main point. This, what we're experiencing, what we're uh, looking at right now, I've been seeing for more than half my life, you know. Um, and and I do feel like now is the time that is is getting better. But again, can't stop here. You know, got to keep going. 
You've been uh, an elite ambassador for Giant now for a little more, a little more than a year, a couple of years, I think. Um, and a couple of years now, yeah. Uh, we began uh, just over the last few months um, the, as a global uh, company uh, have begun uh, a real effort um, to try to talk about, to try to do something about um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, a giant may be a little different than a lot of companies because uh, uh, we're a global company divisions around the world and headquartered our manufacturing mm-hmm. headquarters is, is in Taiwan. Our U S sales headquarters is here in Southern California. Um, and so we reach a lot of people, um, but it's a wide industry. There's just no way around it. It's, it's, it is a wide industry mm-hmm. and it is up to us um, to begin to have those conversations both within the company and without outside the company to, mm-hmm. to make a, to make a difference. Yeah. I think, um, you guys definitely have, and you're not the only one, but we'll speak to giant. I think from my perspective, you have a long haul. And the only reason I say that is because of how you just describe the company. You have this global brand that globally based out of Taiwan, totally different culture, different way of life. Some of the things that we face in the United States, they don't face and then vice versa. So how do you, how do you clash those two and meet in the middle? Right? So I, I know that it's not easy uh, for, for Giant to perhaps, um, you know, really get the powers that be to, to support maybe some sort of movement that's for equality on a bigger scale. Um, given that they may be a little disconnected from really what's going on here. Um, but I think it's definitely something, especially with the leadership that you have here in America that reports or even goes back and forth to Taiwan. I think with the right repetition, with the wordings, with the, like the, um, uh, the consistency around it, I think that a, a brand like Giant can be at the forefront, be the leader of change within the fashion industry. And so I know it's not going to be easy, but I, I think specifically with the people I know at Giant, that you guys can get it done, you know. There, I, I'm going to plug another podcast here. Uh, there was a podcast that you and Alan Lim uh, did with uh, Fred Dreyer from Vela News in uh, early June. Uh, and it was not long after George, George Floyd's death. And you talked at length, um, both of you talked at length about what you experienced and what you continue to experience, uh, in the cycling industry. And I, I want to give, uh, I want to recommend to everybody who's listening to this, to find that podcast on Vela news, because it, it was a great podcast. You did. It was enlightening, uh, painful to listen to uh, for a lot of us, but uh, just a great podcast. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about a new kit uh, that you have out there um, uh, celebrating the 10 years, going back to the 10 years of the anniversary. When when we met um, a year ago uh, and had you on the podcast at that time, you had just gotten a, a propel, a giant propel, and you had a, a, a beautiful, beautiful paint job done on that bike. Um, and we talked a little bit mm-hmm. about that. And, and you have a, a friend who is a designer slash creator, I guess, who did the graphics for that. Did that? Yeah, Mike Hurley. Uh, yeah, yeah he, he, he's amazing, man. So, you know, when when George Floyd happened, um, Mike and I actually worked together at Uh But outside of that, he's just a very uh, artistic guy that's always kind of pushing envelopes. And he hit me up, you know, he's like, man, I got to do something, man. Let's, let's do a bike together. And I said, Hey, what do you have in mind? And he threw out some ideas and, um, you know, I was telling him that, Hey, we're actually working on a, uh, John and I are working on a, a contest where, uh, the public will design our 10 year anniversary kit. And it was just kind of like perfect timing. And then with all, with all the, the civil unrest, I didn't know if we should do it or not because, you know, I, I thought maybe that, that was going to focus on taking uh, things away from what's going on, which is really important. Um, but decided to do it anyway because I thought it was important as well to, to have something positive, you know, uh, continue going with, within our community. So 
it was just perfect timing, man. So we sat down, we knocked out a design together. Most of it was uh, his idea. And um, he, he turned it around, dude, in like in two weeks. I, I called Johnny and I said, hey, you know, we're going to do a custom bike for this, but can we take this bike and do it for that? And it, without hesitation, he was like, oh, of course, you know, let's, let's do it. So it took on a life of its own. And this is how the timing, how perfect it was. Um, our foundation fifth anniversary kit just happened to match the, the bike that he designed. Yeah, it, they they weren't working together. You know, it just happened to come together that way. And so a lot of people think that we did it at the same time, which we did. But um, often by um, you know a lot of thought went into it, a lot of time. He said, if you look at the top few alone, there's over sixty names of people that have been killed. Uh, by police uh, in Justin and Justin and, and they're, those are on the top three and you know you look, I look about this week and you look at it and it's like it looks cool but then you think to yourself how could this look cool this is so sad that we actually have a bike with these many names on here so the bike is uh, it means a lot um, uh, it, it's, it's got a quote from Martin King on it it's got colors that represent you know uh, black people uh, which originated in Africa, so we got red, black, and green on it. And it also, like, the signature racing stripes, which we also have in that hotel uh, that he that he painted for me. So it kind of has a little bit of uh, the, the elements that mean a lot to me, kind of jazzy, I'm a musician, got the race element, and then it has a cause and what the bike is for, what it represents. And I end up calling it the uh, equality bike, uh, which I believe the bike be a topic of conversation uh, for us. To just talk about change, then get some of the frustrations out, and figure out how we can move forward together. And uh, for a plug for Giant here, uh, that is uh, the new TCR, right? The frame for that bike is the new TCR that we've uh, it is. just launched this year. Yeah, and, and I've been on the 2020 TCR, and I, like I said, I hopped on it the 2021. I cut some pain on this weekend, a little Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, I really put it through the ring, like in the hills, through the heat, descending, you name it. And uh, definitely a different ride. Uh, it, it's a little stiffer. It's, uh, it, it glides a little better than the 2020 frame. Geometry is a little different. Um, but yeah, now I'm like, I got to get a, a 2021 TCR so I can really ride it because I would hate to crash this one. Um, so yeah, great bike. Uh, I mean, uh, this is not all about Giant, but it is a great bike. Um, and and uh, if you want to the market for a new, new road bike, I would definitely consider the, the uh, 2021 TCR. And uh, the anniversary kit, uh, the the jersey and, and the bibs, I'm still waiting on mine. I, I know it's going to come any day now, but the, we have seen posts where there are folks who are starting to receive that, uh, that special 10th anniversary mm-hmm. kit. And it really is just a beautiful Beautiful, beautiful design Thank on the you. kit. So I, I want to talk a little bit about Criterium Racing. Uh, going back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, and people who are not in the industry, who are, aren't aren't that familiar with cycling, when you, you mention bicycle racing, they think, oh, Tour de France, Giro d'Italia, maybe. But Criterium Racing is um, alive and well. And uh, you mm-hmm. have been, uh, you've just recently on your YouTube channel, uh, gotten back into racing. I, I, I'm assuming that you just couldn't stay around the house any while longer and you, you had to get back <laughs> out and, and uh, turn some pedals. Yeah, some of these practice scripts have uh, have opened up and, um, yeah, you know, when the pandemic hit and we were on the lockdown, per se, um, I didn't go out. I, I, I rode the rift. I was indoors for about three months and uh, finally went outdoors and did a road ride and then, all right, Maybe I should be safe. I'll continue to stay inside. But yeah, the group rides opened up and I went out and did one and, you know, figured out I had no leg speed and I'm slow, but it was still a lot of fun. So you start to go out, you get hooked again. And now I've been driving my car across Southern California doing these different practice trips and enjoying it. Um, it, it is something that, you know, it's just a part of me. And, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it'll ever go away. You know, I, I may be 67 years old still doing a trip. You know, hopefully, God willing, I'm, I'm healthy enough to do that stuff. But crit racing is like, 
it, it takes me back to childhood almost. Uh, it, it's a skill set that I developed when I was young. Uh, it, it's one of those things that, and sometimes I try to explain it, but it's hard to articulate because in crit racing, unlike any other style of racing, uh, maybe track racing, I have the same kind of mentality. I can see what's going to happen before it happens. Yeah. I know that sounds crazy, but I can look at riders. I can, I can just tell by their body language what they're getting ready to do. If they're feeling good, if they're feeling bad, like I, I, I can just, I just see it. And I think that's why I was so successful at bike racing, uh, crit racing at, at least. And, uh, doing these practice crits really has brought me back to just like, I'm smiling right now as I talk to you, uh, just the good old days of, of racing crits. What's great about the videos that you've posted on your YouTube channel. And I urge everybody to go take a look is that you, in post-production, you're explaining the crits. You're explaining what's going on. We see the route. Um, you have an onboard camera shooting forward. You uh, talk to the camera at times. You really do a great job with this. And it's just, in addition to being very informative, it's pretty funny, too, at times. <laughs> because uh, you're, you're pretty you're pretty honest about the racing ability of, the, of yourself and the people around you. Yeah. I mean, you have to be. And some people like... You know, you can't, why are you telling them your secrets? I'm like, it's not a secret. Nothing I just did was a secret experience. Yeah. You know, um, and me telling you what I'm thinking, even, even if you listen to it a thousand times, you still have to go out and execute it. Yeah. You can tell me right now how to do a podcast, but if I don't go out and do the podcast and do it correctly, I just know what I listen to. You know what I mean? Like you could, somebody could tell me how to make a million dollars. I don't mean I can go out and do it. So that's how I look at when I, when I tell people, um, when people ask, why are you giving away secrets? It's not a secret. I, I'm not recreating the will, you know, I'm just showing you and explaining what I saw from my perspective. And, and that's the beauty of bike racing too. What I may have explained in one particular clip, just because I explained it in that clip and that's how it went down at that given time. Doesn't mean it's going to go down the same way in the same course the next week. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. It's bike racing. Yeah. There's so many different variables. So, uh, and, and at the end of the day too, I don't make money at bike racing anymore. So it doesn't matter if you're better than me on the bike. It, it, maybe 10 years ago, you know, I wouldn't let out if you want to call them secrets, but now it doesn't matter. I'm a master's racer. I do it for fun. I went cliff on it, you know? So <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. <laughs> Uh, we'll finish up here. I want to find out how you're doing with your family uh, during lockdown. Uh, you have three daughters, um, and we're just mm -hmm. restarting the school year now. How is how's all of it going? Yeah, so far so good, man. You know, um, once they were sent home last March, it was a it was a big bit of a shakeup. At the same time, uh, my office was closed, and so I'm home working full time, and this is. Uh, right when things started to hit the fan. So uh, I think we've adjusted. Uh, they're definitely getting into a groove. I think one of the biggest challenges is just making sure they stay active. Uh, you know, they're sitting at a computer for, you know, six, seven hours out of the day. And then when that's done, all they want to do is eat and relax. So, uh, you know, without being the mean dad, is like making sure they, they get up and, and, and get some, some exercise and get, get outdoors. Uh, but other than that, man, you know, we're, we're extremely blessed. Everyone is, is healthy. We're all safe. We, we all have, uh, we all have a job. So, you know, things could be a lot worse. Um, so we just definitely do it. Have, have any of the girls raced, you know, actually done a bike race? <laughs> no, just the kid races, you yeah. know, just the kid races. Um, you know, it's funny though, when I do take them out and, you know, my oldest daughter is 16, she can fit my road bike. Wow. So I put her on one of my old road bikes, let the seat down a little bit, but didn't have to change the stem or any of that stuff. Crank lens, all, all was good. And, you know, man, they get on the bike, all three of them are really good. Just naturally, like, pedal stroke is natural. We can cruise along the riverbed at 16, 17 miles an hour without them struggling. And it's pretty amazing. So, you know, maybe one day as they get older, maybe they'll get into a sport at, you know, in college or something like that, and they come back and want to be a bike racer. But, um, I learned from my parents, don't push your kids too hard. So, uh, my, my parents just supported me. They never, ever told me to go train, never told me to check my heart rate. None of that stuff. They just, as long as I wanted it, 
they wanted it too. And one of the things I tell my kids is that I can't want it more than you. So when I when I want you to be a bike racer more than you or or or, or exercise more than you, it's not going to work. You got to have to want it. So uh, that's kind of how I live my life with them. The things that they're passionate about, I pursue it. Uh, that's great advice. That's great advice for everybody, um, but great advice from a dad too. Um, mm-hmm. R- Rasan, it's been great talking to you. I, uh, I, I am sorry. We, it's been a year since we've really had a chance to chat uh, for one of the podcasts, mm-hmm. but uh, I want to thank you for taking some time today and uh, best of luck. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary of the foundation. And uh, I hope we get to chat, do one of these in person soon. Yeah, anytime. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Take it easy, man. Bye-bye.